Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night, and he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water, that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. Hello, I'm Pastor Gervais Charmley. Welcome back to Bethel Evangelical Free Church Hanley on YouTube. In this video, I'm going to be continuing a series on these old works of Scottish theology, the Cunningham Lectures. Almost finished this series now, actually. This is, uh, well, there's only three more after this one. The last two videos, I must confess, were not very much to my taste in terms of the subject matter. I had to force myself to to do them to some extent, because I'm not a great fan of this 1920s constructive theology that we find with A.B. Macaulay, and form criticism is not a subject I find very helpful, edifying. And both of these men, Macaulay and Manson, they're very, very much professors doing what professors do. This next volume in the Cunningham Lectures, the 1944 Cunningham Lectures, delivered in those dark days of World War II, Guard in the Psalms, written by George S. Gunn. And it's much more to my taste. It's a back to an Old Testament book. It's the first one on Old Testament books since Skinner on Jeremiah. So who was George S. Gunn? George S. Gunn was a pastor, a preacher, a theologian, and an Old Testament man in a day when preaching from the Old Testament was seen as, well, difficult. Here we are. Here's his portrait in this volume of his sermons by well, the indispensable Christ, it's called. It was published after his death. In memorial, and you can see he's got a, a happy, jolly-looking man. He he is there, and by all accounts, the photograph does not lie. He was born on September the seventh, nineteen hundred, at Dunnet in Caithness, where his father was a, a crofter, a maker of surgical boots, and a respected member of the community, and more importantly, the Free Church, the United Free Church, as it was by that point. He had no fewer than ten siblings, so the, the little craft was a, a busy, crowded place, and as much as possible they would play outside. His father was a, a deeply devout man who kept up the old and important practice of family worship. The old family Bible would be taken down and reverently read, and it was from his father that Gunn learned to love the Bible and to love the Book of Psalms. How important it is for Christian parents to show to their children that they love the Word of God, that the Word of God is a wonderful thing. And it was through this preaching, the, well, through this family teaching rather, this family worship, his, his father's living Christianity, that he was led to consider the ministry. But before he could become a minister, George Gunn had to be a soldier. Because the time came when he had reached the age when he could be called up. And Britain was fighting the First World War. And so Gunn was called up as a private soldier, an ordinary soldier, to fight. His faith sustained him through that. We hear very often today stories about people losing their faith in, well, during the First World War. But for every story of someone losing their faith, there are others of people, of men in the trenches, who kept their faith or found their faith. Their faith went from being something that was perhaps theoretical something second-hand to being something real, true, and lived. So it certainly was with George Gunn. He kept his faith. And in 1919, after being demobbed, he went to Edinburgh University, where he graduated 
with a first-class degree in 1922. He proceeded at once to New College to study for the ministry of the United Free Church, where he had an outstanding record in every department. But he was particularly interested in the Old Testament, very much because of the professor, Adam Cleghorn Welch. Now, I know Welch from his little book on Anselm, but, I, but he was really a, an Old Testament professor. And his book on, on the Psalms excited the young, recently, well, fairly recently, demobbed soldier, George Gunn. He served several assistantships, and in July 1926, he was called to the United Free Church, Juniper Green, then a little village just outside Edinburgh. It's now a suburb. He spent there 11 years of what he described as idyllic happiness. And there were several other calls that said, come and uh, come over to our church. And he said, no, I, no, I'm happy here. I will remain at Juniper Green. But in 1934... He applied to succeed Welsh at the, in the Old Testament chair at New College, but he was not accepted. Somebody else got the job instead. And so he stayed at Juniper Green until he was called in 1937 to Broughton Place in Edinburgh, in the, the centre of the city. Now, Broughton Place was a, a famous church. It had been part of the United Presbyterian Church, famous well, the most famous minister there was John Brown, whose commentary on Hebrews, for example, is still in print today, and he preached on, on many, many subjects. John Brown was a, a popular preacher. The church had declined a little bit, and they were looking for somebody with great pastoral and preaching gifts to take the, take the pulpit. And Gunn accepted, and he, so he moved from the edge of Edinburgh, right into the centre. Within a couple of years, writes the author of his memoir here in the sermon volume, within a couple of years of his induction to Broughton Place, the Second World War broke out, and George's lucid, vigorous and confident expositions of the central themes of the Gospel did much to comfort and sustain his people during the years of ordeal. To sit there and absorb the message that the minister proclaimed Sunday by Sunday with prophetic fire or to grasp those fundamentals of the faith that still stand when all else in the world is tottering. These are the words of the Reverend Alistair Gibson, who was George's assistant during the darkest days of the war. He was no short measures man. His sermons could be, well, they were always over half an hour long, and sometimes they could be as long as 40 minutes. And Alex Shane, another one of his assistants, says that they were packed with illustration and quotation full of evidence of familiarity with contemporary biblical and theological studies, rich in knowledge of the doubts and fears and failings and aspirations of his people. They were strong meat. Strong meat. They seemed to some to be a little old-fashioned, but the congregation hung on his every word. Put that back. He was a man for whom preach the word was the central imperative of the ministry. He also served on a couple of committees. First of all, he served as convener of the General Assembly's the Church's Co Committee on Foreign Missions. He served in that role between 1944 and 1949 in the, the rebuilding after the ravages of war, which had affected, of course, communications with the missionaries, but also, particularly in the Far East, in China, for example, the actual missionaries had been arrested by the Japanese and interned. In 1946, he visited Africa to tour the, the African missions of what was now the Church of Scotland, and his appreciation of what had been done in the past was reflected in his attitude towards those who were carrying it on at the time. In 1951 he was appointed convener of the Committee for the Education for the Ministry and he served 
very well on it again as, as this preacher. He was a man who looked for education in preaching to make men who were preachers and pastors and not men who were academics. In 1948 he was awarded the DD by Edinburgh University and in 1959 he was chairman of the yeah, Bible Society of Scotland. But at that time he started to experience bouts of illness. He felt it was just a bit run down or something, perhaps it's a bit of the flu, but it wasn't. It was cancer. And initially he suggested it might be food poisoning or something. So he went without going to the doctor for too long. In 1960 he finally realised he was getting no better and it couldn't be food poisoning. He went to see the doctor. The doctor sent him to the hospital. The hospital examined him and they pronounced it was cancer and it was inoperable. So that he died on January the 11th, 1961, aged, of course, only 60. He was an old man. He was a relatively young man when he died, and he was taken away in the midst of his years. Taken away, as he, I think, would have wanted. He died without having to retire. He died as the pastor of Broughton Place. So we come to his rather wonderful lectures on God in the Psalms. The subject he announced when he gave the lectures at New College was the doctrine of God in the Book of Psalms. But quite rightly, when it came to publication, he said, God in the Psalms looks better on the back of a book, and doesn't it? His appreciation of the Book of Psalms is very deep and very wonderful. He begins saying, The Book of Psalms is the best known and the most deeply understood part of the Old Testament. And that's always a good thing for a writer to say. I remember some years ago uh, a new book on the Book of Jonah that came out and rather weirdly in the introduction said that, worse the effect, that the Book of Jonah is the most uh, um, neglect, is one of the most neglected parts of the Old Testament. No, it's not! It's also unfortunate that the book was entirely pedestrian and just like half a dozen other books, short books on the book of Jonah, which we don't need more of the same. So he begins by saying, of course, everyone knows the Psalms, understood. The fundamental unity of the Old and New Testaments is strongest here. And that is the ultimate reason for the essential and abiding incorporation of the Psalms in Christian worship so that they have become the richest element in the praise of the two greatest religions of mankind. It is a book of worship. And it's approached theologically. It is supremely important to study the theology of what is used in worship, for no one is able to measure or even to exaggerate the influence, conscious or unconscious, of the words which are repeated constantly in the service of the Church, both in praise and prayer. As has been well pointed out, there ought to be no sharp dualism between scientific and devotional exegesis. And he's citing here Franz Hildebrandt, that refugee from Hitler's Germany, that half-Jewish minister, a man who stood with a foot therefore in the Old Testament and in the New, a man who had his Jewish antecedents, but also was a Lutheran and had all that German praise, the German chorale tradition in him. There is so much to be said, so many quotations in this book that are so valuable. For example, worship can never rise to its best and highest unless the thoughts of God behind the words which the worshippers recite or sing are known to be and experienced as true. Therefore the Bible, therefore the Psalms contain the best revelation of all that Israel had come to believe concerning its God. He criticises the drastic surgery that says that changes in mood in Psalms mean we've got to chop them up and say they're by multiple writers. Such drastic surgery is not called for, especially when it is performed for 
other than linguistic or stylistic reasons. The undoubted fact of varying moods in a psalm is itself no evidence for divided authorship. Of course not. And he notes, when John Calvin came to write an introduction to his commentary on the Psalms, after he had completed it, he simply set about telling the story of his own life, the supreme lesson which had been impressed upon him by his long elaborate study was that he knew himself better than before. The Psalter, he says, is the soul's anatomy, which demands life for its true exegesis. I would have my readers to understand that the small measure of experience which I have had by the conflicts with which the law has exercised me has in no ordinary degree assisted me not only in applying to present use whatever instruction could be gathered from these divine compositions, but also in more easily comprehending the design of each of the writers. It is a marvellous book that looks at the Psalms with well, so many different angles. He begins with a chapter on approaches and assumptions. He speaks of the fringes of his ways, the nature psalms, the psalms that speak of God and nature. The divine control of history, God who is over all things. The divine conflict with evil. The essentials of personal religion. The stresses of personal religion. And fulfilment in worship. This is one of those books, I say, some of these books are interesting as snapshots of a particular era in time or in theology, but they are not really books to be read and enjoyed today. I'm not sure they're books to be, read, to be enjoyed at all, some of them. Certainly Macaulay isn't. Um, but this is a book of abiding value, God in the Psalms by George S. Gunn. It's a, a book by a preacher for preachers, and it's a book that is clearly the, the fruit of much preaching and study of the Book of Psalms. And so I commend this one. Read it, enjoy it, and sing the Psalms heartily, for the Psalms are given for singing. Well, thank you for watching, and may God bless you and help you in the study of his own holy word.